I was reminded that at a Good Friday Tenebrae service, we don't actually have a sermon, but a homily. And the difference between a sermon and a homily is, one, the length of time, a homily is much shorter, and two, a homily focuses on and meditates on one particular point. So if you have a short amount of time to say one thing about the life of Jesus, we would be in pretty good shape if we spent that time focusing on the cross. I say that, but the cross is anything but simple. It's an inexhaustible topic, and it would and does take um, our, our whole lifetime to discover and to cover all of the ground of the cross. And may it be that we do spend our lifetime meditating and studying and learning of the cross of Christ. But for our purposes here tonight, we need to be much more specific. We need to narrow that down. And how I will do that tonight in this homily is to focus on the three last words that Jesus spoke from the cross. It is finished. It was about 3 o'clock p.m. this afternoon that Jesus utters these last three words and gave up his life. It is finished. It is finished indeed. But in the original Greek language, Those three words, it is finished, is actually just one word, tetelestai, it is finished. Whenever tetelestai is used, it is used to mean that a project or some initiative in its entirety is now complete. It means there is no more to be done and that what was owed is now paid in full. It's like if you lived in Palestine in the days of Jesus and you commissioned a a contractor or a carpenter to build you a house. You pay the full amount, and after he drives in that final nail and hands you the keys, he would say to you, to Telestai, it is done, job done, paid in full. And that is what Jesus announces from the cross in his final words, job done, paid in full, it is finished. But that actually leaves us with a very important question. What exactly is finished? What was this job that had to be done, and what was this debt we owed that had to be paid in full? So to answer that question is the whole width and breadth of theology in general, but let us look at a few visual clues tonight as we look at what that means. Now, the first visual clue comes from the Gospel of Matthew, and in Matthew 27, verse 50, The gospel writer is recording these exact moments that John is recording. And Matthew is writing here, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks split. Imagine that scene. The earthquake at Jesus' death is shaking, but the rocks are splitting. And if you've ever heard a rock being split, it makes a very distinct piercing crack. And so as Jesus dies on the cross and the earthquake comes to Jerusalem, large boulders are splitting in two, and you could hear that all throughout the valley. And gravestones, where those big boulders are rolled in front of the grave opening, those two are being split apart. But the temple curtain is split as well. It's one of the most important visuals we want to take from this crucifixion story. It requires a brief explanation, though, why that's uh, important, why that's noteworthy. So Jesus dies at around 3 o'clock in the afternoon on this day. And yet in Jerusalem, not a single person did not know that Jesus was being crucified. Still... That said, they had to get their lambs to the temple on this day, the day of preparation. You see, at this time, each family brought an unblemished lamb into the temple. And the priests, the chief priests, would, they would slaughter the lambs, and the chief, chief priests would take the blood of those lambs and sprinkle that on the altar of God's presence. But they had to do this by 6 o'clock because at 6 o'clock in the evening, That's when the Jewish day comes to an end and Passover begins. 
So all of the activity with the cross is not unnoticed, but there's a lot of activity in the temple at this moment. No one, though, could enter the Holy of Holies. This is that place where only the priest, the chief priest, was allowed to go, and the the huge curtain that separated that was over four inches thick. It was 60 feet tall and 30 feet wide. The ancient writer Josephus writes, it was so thick that when they would hook horses up and tied that to the, the curtain to the horses, the horses could not pull it apart. And when it needed to come down for a good washing, it took over 300 priests just to lift this. But notice what else Matthew writes. It's an important detail often overlooked. He's not just describing the earthquakes and the rock splitting and the temple curtain tearing. He's describing the direction in which it tears from the top to the bottom. The, Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews is looking at this very scene in chapter 10 of Hebrews when that writer says, where there is forgiveness of these sins, there is no longer any offering for sin required. Therefore, we have confidence to enter the holy of holies by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. The curtain of separation is the visual symbol of reality as those people knew it that explained the covenant of the law, that separation between God and sinful humanity. And I want you to remember this visual because it helps us answer that question, what exactly is finished? The curtain separating God's presence from sinful people has been removed and forgiveness made available to all who would believe. Go back to Hebrews 10. Where there is forgiveness of these sins, there is no longer any offering required for that sin. Where is their forgiveness then? Here, on the cross. The cross, the holy lamb of God, has been presented. Not the sheeps that men bring, but the son that God brings. His blood has been spilled for all who would trust on God's mercy. One holy, acceptable, and eternal offering. That sacrifice before God. And where there is forgiveness, there is no longer the need for sacrifice of sins. And that location, that where, has moved from the temple to the cross. From the curtain to the cross. And my friends, that's where it remains today. If you think of Romans chapter 3, Paul is thinking of this very thing when he writes in verse 20, for by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. And in 6, chapter, Romans chapter 6, 23, Paul says this, our famous verse, for the wages of sin is death. The temple curtain is split, but it's split by God. Because the perfect sacrifice for sin given in the death of his son Jesus on the cross fulfills that. For those who cast their hope on the cross, not the temple, not the curtain, but on the cross, those who cast their hope on the cross, their sin is forgiven. And if there is forgiveness of sin, then eternal death and damnation is no more. This is what Jesus is announcing to us from the cross in his final words. This was the part of the plan that is now finished. And when he says it is finished, sin and death are finished for those who in faith put their trust in him and cast all of their hope on that cross. Said another way, death of death at the death of the cross. The great pastor Charles Spurgeon said this, Once more, my friends, take comfort from these words. It is finished, for the redemption of Christ's church is perfected. There is not another penny to be paid for her full release. Those whom Jesus bought with blood are forever clear of all charges, paid for to the utmost. There was written a verdict against us, but Christ has taken it away. He has nailed it to the cross. It is 
finished, and it's finished forever. What comfort there is in that glorious truth. In fact, if you've ever wondered why we call Good Friday good, this is the reason. There is good news. From the curtain to the cross, Spurgeon is right. What comfort there is in this glorious truth. But there is a word of warning on this night, too, and we must hear it. You see, Good Friday is not good news for everyone. To look at the cross and know that Jesus died on the cross is not enough. This is historical information. But to those who know they are a sinner, know that Christ died for sinners on that cross, it's good news. To those who cast themselves wholly upon Christ's pardon and peace, Good Friday is indeed good news. For those, however, who are not willing to do this, Good Friday is anything but good news. Acknowledge, I pray, your deepest need. Confess your sinful situation and come. To any of you here tonight that know the Lord is calling you to the cross, then I urge you, come. Come to the cross, to him. You don't have to be better. You don't have to be more or less sinful to come to the cross. Come as you are and cry out just as you are. Cast yourself upon God's mercy here poured out for you on the cross. Here tonight in our Tenebrae service, what we're doing is setting before you the cross of Christ. Yet take comfort, my friends. Christ is not passively waiting for you to do anything. He is on the move. Christ is active, working with and through his word in order to bring you to himself. And that, my friends, is the good news of Good Friday. I pray it's your good news too. And if you don't know that to be true, do not delay. Come to the cross. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we do come to you at the end of this meditation on the cross. You, you have held us accountable to the truth of the cross because it is so clear. Your redemption is over all of the scriptures, and throughout you have given us one message, one message to us all, that you want to have a relationship with us. That is the truth. And help us honestly evaluate our own lives, and if for us the cross is merely an historical event, then help us see the amazing truth, the amazing grace of your truth, that you would love us so much that you sent your son to die on the cross for us. And Father, by the help of your Holy Spirit, may we come and cast ourselves on the cross to cry out to you for this mercy and to be delivered from our sin, to be moved from the curtain of separation to the cross of your everlasting presence. We pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen.